In the year 334 BC, Alexander III, King of Macedon, embarked on a monumental military expedition. His target, the mighty Persian Empire, the superpower of its time. Despite being only 22 years old, Alexander earned himself a reputation for leading his men to battle with impressive speed, often breaking enemy lines before his foes knew what hit them. In 15 years of conquest, Alexander would never lose a battle, reaching to the very limits of the known world and establishing an empire that stretched from Greece to India and as far south as Egypt. Few individuals have left a more profound mark on the course of human history. He was also ruthless, dictatorial, and ambitious to the point of regarding himself as divine. For the Persians, he was an unrelenting force of terror. They called him Alexander the Accursed. To the West, he became an immortal legend known as Alexander the Great. Alexander showed remarkable promise from a young age. He was not just the son of the most extraordinary and powerful king in Greek history. He was also the son of one of the most interesting females. Olympias. His mother's story is captivating, albeit shrouded in rumors. Whispers circulate that she may have been a Molossian witch, rumored to share her bed with serpents and serve as a devoted follower of Dionysos, the god of wine. She comes from a people who the Macedonians considered barbarian. The Molossians were a powerful tribe that lived in the rugged terrain of the ancient kingdom of Epirus, located in northwestern Greece and south of the modern-day country of Albania. This remarkable woman, whom even the greatest geopolitical figure of the time, Philip, found at times difficult to deal with, continued to wield her influence long after his passing. Both Philip's generals and later those of Alexander struggled to contend with her intellect and determination. She consistently outwitted her adversaries, ensuring the best interests for her son were protected at all costs. One of the most famous stories about Alexander's childhood is the taming of the horse Bucephalus, which, whether or not this account is true, celebrated his ingenuity, immense self-confidence, and his skill as a rider. The story goes, a Thessalian merchant came to Philip's court, bringing with him a large stallion called Bucephalus, or ox head. The horse was magnificent, tall and dark, and Philip was interested in purchasing him. But he seemed unbroken and wouldn't let anyone ride him. The king decided that such a horse was not worth the price. His son was of a different opinion, saying loudly they were losing a great horse because they didn't know how to handle him. His father turned it into a challenge and wager, betting the price of the horse to Alexander if he couldn't ride it. Alexander climbed on the horse, noticing it was scared of its own shadow and spoke softly to him, stroking his head, before slowly riding away. And when he saw the horse was rid of fear, he urged him on with a thrust of foot. Philip went from fear for his son's life to tearful pride as Alexander galloped away. Bucephalus became Alexander's favorite horse, ridden in all of his key battles. And his death in India was marked by the founding of a city, Bukefala, which is found in modern-day Pakistan. Alexander grew up being taught that he was the descendant of legendary heroes on both sides of his family, Achilles through his mother and Hercules through his father. Imagine what that did to his psyche and self-confidence from a young age. This unique heritage was further honed by the world's greatest Greek philosopher, scientist, and teacher of the time, Aristotle. Alexander's education included politics, ethics, and Aristotle encouraged an interest in the natural world, especially in medicine and healing. 
Alexander also had a keen interest in music and studied famous texts, starting with Homer and paying particular respect to the glories of Athenian literature and drama. Another significant influence from Aristotle that greatly shaped Alexander's future was teaching him history, particularly what occurred in the previous centuries. Aristotle taught Alexander about the Persian Empire's repeated invasions of Greece, the immense suffering and battles that had transpired during these invasions, including the famed battles of Marathon, Salamis, the heroic stand at Thermopylae, and the tragic destruction and burning of Athens. This historical context fueled Alexander's deep-seated resentment towards the Persian Empire perceiving them as an existential threat, capable of striking once more. This became one of the primary factors behind Alexander's motivation to later invade Persia. He aimed to preempt any future aggression. A secondary, albeit less significant motive for Alexander's campaign was the pursuit of power, wealth and glory. However, it's important to note that material wealth wasn't his primary driving force. Alexander sought to carve his name in history as a hero and spread Hellenic civilization across the known world. Alexander was much shorter than the average for Greeks in the 4th century BC. Although he was well proportioned, strong and a good sprinter, his complexion was fair, sometimes rosy and his hair is described as golden like a lion's. His eyes were oddly colored, one blue-gray and the other brown, which may have contributed to his unusual and sometimes off-putting gaze. At some stage he developed a habit for leaning his head a little to the left and staring upwards, presumably higher than the taller men often standing around him. Through alliances and military conquest, Philip, the father of Alexander, successfully united all of Greece under the banner of the Hellenic League, also known as the League of Corinth, with Philip as its supreme commander. Only Sparta abstained from this alliance. Philip then began to strategize for a pan-Hellenic campaign against the weakening Persian Empire, which once their formidable adversary, now appeared vulnerable with its vast riches ready to be seized. On the brink of launching this ambitious campaign, Philip met a tragic end. He was assassinated by a member of his own bodyguard, a victim of the ruthless power struggles within the Macedonian court. In the wake of his assassination, his 20-year-old son, Alexander, ascended to the throne and continued his father's grand ambitions. As Alexander assumes the reins of power, a coalition of Greek city-states sees an opportunity to challenge the seemingly inexperienced 20-year-old. They likely believed that the young ruler couldn't possibly replicate his father's formidable feats, but they would soon discover that Underestimating Alexander was a grave miscalculation. During the initial year and a half of his reign, Alexander dedicated himself to demonstrating his capability to lead the formidable army inherited from his father. He not only quashed the insurrections of various Thracian tribes to the north, but also carried out a ruthless campaign resulting in the complete destruction of the city of Thebes. This act of brutality was so severe that numerous historians contend it surpassed the actions of any Persian ruler during their occupation of Greece 150 years earlier. It sends the message, and Greece is brought under his rule. He reinforces the League of Corinth, which acts like an ancient version of NATO where Greek cities contribute troops to his cause. Opinions on the level of enthusiasm among other Greek states 
for sending troops and supporting Alexander in his campaign against the Persians very widely. Alexander's skill at crafting messaging around him was legendary, making it difficult to distinguish between fact and fiction when examining the ancient accounts. During his crossing into Asia, there's a famous story of Alexander casting a spear across the water, symbolically claiming all of Asia by right of conquest. Alexander personally led the Companion Cavalry. They were an elite and prestigious unit in the Macedonian army. The Companion Cavalry rode larger horses than was normal in the rest of Greece. Although these unarmored mounts suffered a far higher casualty rate than their riders, and in due course, more and more would ride captured Persian animals, which were lighter and faster. Early saddles were in use among the Scythians, so it is entirely possible that the Macedonians adopted them. The wealthier companions did have a saddle cloth, often the pelt of a lion or other big cat which helped pad and protect the horse's back. Alexander and his men relied on exceptional horsemanship to keep their seat without the aid of modern riding gear. A groom also accompanied each rider to keep his horse and equipment in good condition. They were basically the ancient equivalent of knights. Ancient art does not depict the companions to carry shields, but relying instead on a helmet with an open face to see and hear well, with a metal cuirass and greaves for added protection. Their primary offensive weapon was the ziston, a long spear designed with a slim shaft and lightweight wood, so it could be wielded in one hand. The slimness kept it light, but also meant it would frequently break and shatter on impact. There was a butt spike, which could be used to stab with what was left of the other end but most often the rider would rely on his sword. Next was the Hypaspists, the most professional soldiers in the army. Recruited for their bravery and ability, they were also the most frequently engaged. They usually carried a traditional large hoplon shield with an eight-foot spear, resembling classical Greek hoplites. What made them so effective was the selection of recruits, high standards of drill and training, and long experience of victory. The main bulk of the army consisted of the phalanx, equipped with the Sarissa pikes. They would keep the most reliable and brave men at the back and front of the phalanx, making it more difficult for others to flee as long as these picked men stayed in place. Another notable unit of Alexander's army were the Thessalian cavalry. Pride among the allied contingents, they were similar to the companions, capable of launching shock charges, but carried a shorter and more maneuverable spear. This was a far better balanced, more flexible force than any army previously raised by a Greek state. Greek armies had come to Asia Minor before, but all of them had failed in the long run and retreated. Alexander's army was larger than any past invader from Greece, but the resources available to him were still dwarfed by the money and manpower of Persia, even with the support of his Greek allies. The king of Persia, Darius III, was twice Alexander's age, but had only been king for about the same amount of time, and like Alexander, he had succeeded the throne in the aftermath of a murder, the latest in a succession of assassinations. Alexander's first field battle will occur soon after crossing into Asia. One of the main sources for these events says the king of Persia had been given conflicting advice by different counselors as to what to do about the Alexander problem. There was a famous Greek mercenary working with the Persians, Memnon of Rhodes. He urged caution. He understood how powerful the Macedonian army was and advised them to stay away 
and wait for Darius to arrive with the royal army, believing only then would they stand a chance. He suggested a scorched earth policy to cut off their army from supplies, avoid it, delay it, and make them starve until they straggle away home in defeat. The satraps of this area were not enthused by this idea. It would be their farms that needed to be burned. The Rhodian Memnon was not popular in the Persian court. Whether from jealousy or because he was a Greek, they decided not to listen to his advice. The Persians didn't want to back down and run away from this fight. They sent local forces to confront Alexander. This is a critical juncture for Alexander. If he loses, he retreats home. The Persians enjoy the advantage of fighting on their home turf. They have the capability to regroup and field more armies even if they suffer a loss. According to Arian, when Alexander's forces encountered the Persian defenders at the Granicus River, the Persians consisted of approximately 20,000 cavalry and 20,000 infantry. Alexander's estimates are in the same ballpark, with him commanding roughly 30,000 to 35,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry. It's crucial to understand that Alexander comes off as the type of person who had genuine enthusiasm for warfare. He didn't lead his men out of a sense of duty, but rather derived great satisfaction from it. To him, participation in battles wasn't just about issuing orders to conquer and raise a city. It involved deeply personal and gruesome acts. It's essential not to judge his actions through a modern cultural lens. This behavior was the norm in his time. Warfare was not only accepted, but it was glorified in the context of heroic deeds, defending one's people and seeking honor and fame. When you delve into Arian's accounts of Alexander's actions in close combat at the Granicus, it becomes evident how brutal and up close the fighting was. Arian says the Persians massed a bunch of troops together and from their side of the battlefield follow Alexander as he moved in his distinctive cloak and armor with a crowd around him. His helmet marked him out, for as well as a central crest, it had a white plume on each side. A mass of Persian cavalry followed Alexander as he moved up and down the bank of the opposite side of the river. Their job was to take him out the head of the snake. Arian recounts that Alexander's reaction to the situation was a bold charge right into the heart of the chaos. The composition of the Persian army may have evolved over time, particularly after numerous conflicts with the Greeks. The Persians had difficulty dealing with the Greek phalanx and as a result would hire their own Greek mercenaries with an estimated 10 to 20,000 of them present at this battle. The Persian forces were positioned on one side of the river, giving the battle its name, the Battle of the River Granicus. On the opposite bank lay a steep incline, atop which a lengthy line of Persian cavalry awaited. The strategic thinking appears to have been that crossing a relatively shallow body of water, coupled with the challenge of scrambling up the bank would inevitably disrupt the Greek formation. Meanwhile, a line of cavalry stood ready to charge from a considerable distance, making it seem like an effective plan from the Persian perspective. Cavalry tactics have undergone significant changes over time. In the past, the Persians primarily employed missile weapons in their attacks and avoided direct clashes with enemy formations. However, during Alexander's era, both his heavy cavalry and the Persian cavalry adopted a strategy of charging headlong into the fray. The evolution of cavalry warfare traces back to the Central Asian horse tribes, and by Alexander's time, both sides possessed formidable melee cavalry. Unlike the Greek wars of 150 years before, where Persians lacked a comparable counterpart, battles of this era often featured Persian and Macedonian cavalry 
engaging in knightly style combat. Alexander slams into the Persian cavalry, where he almost dies. This is what it's like for Alexander in the battle, from Arian. Alexander led his Macedonian cavalry through the riverbed and directly to the position of the satraps and Persian grandees on the other side. When the two lines struck, Alexander broke his lance in the fighting. He cried to a groom for another, but the groom's own lance was broken and defending himself bravely with the stump. Ask somebody else, he shouted. When another one of his retinue surrendered his lance to the king, Alexander spied Mithridates, a son-in-law of Darius the Great King, advancing, riding out from his guard. The Macedonian drove his lance straight through the Persian's face, flinging him to the ground. Now Rusakis, another Persian, brother of the satrap of Lydia, struck Alexander on the head with a sword, slicing off part of his helmet, which nevertheless dulled the full force of the impact. Clearing Mithridates' gore off his lance, Alexander took Rosakis in the chest, piercing his cuirass and hurling him to the ground as well. In the melee behind the king, the satraps Mithridates swung back to deliver a great blow to avenge his fallen brother, but Alexander's companion, Cletus, was there first, with his own sword and clove off at the shoulder, the arm that was upraised to fell the king. It was at this moment in the fighting, this cascade of arterial blood, that panic began to spread among the Persians until it carried them fleeing from the field. Think about all the chaos that occurred in this battle. One way or another, it seems that Alexander's forces drive the Persian cavalry off. The Greek mercenaries were too far back to have any kind of impact on the battle, and Alexander ends up butchering them and selling the rest as slaves. And the battle of the Granicus is over. Alexander had secured a great victory. For the time being, there was nothing left to stop him from taking over the various cities in Asia Minor. But the Persian Empire was still dangerous was already marshalling its vast armies and resources to confront him. Alexander's next threat loomed on the horizon. If he was to take over the Persian Empire, next he would have to face the King of Kings himself, Darius III.